Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, based on your time chart. Welcome in Salesforce Apex Hour. And today topic is the security in Salesforce. My name is Amit Chaudhary. I'm the founder of the Apex Hour. And uh, we have a special guest from the Salesforce Alpha. So let me hand over her for her introduction and for the presentation. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Alba Rivas. I am a developer advocate at Salesforce. I work from Spain, from the south of Spain. So for me, it's 4 p.m. at the moment. I know that there are people from all over the world. So thank you so much for joining, whatever the time it is for you. And I know it's Saturday. I'm going to try to make the session interesting and um, easy to follow for you. Um, if you have questions, you can ask me the questions at the end of the presentation, or if you have questions during the talk, you can also write them on the chat window because I'm going to be monitoring the chat as well. Thank you so much, Amit, for, for inviting me. I'm super happy to be here at Apex Hours. And let's start with the presentation. So here you have my contact details, also just in case you want to contact uh, with me later. And today I'm going to talk about a topic that is of high interest for developers, which is security. But we are going to take a look at this topic from the um, developer mindset. This is, I'm not going to explain how to configure security in Salesforce or how to monitor security in Salesforce. I assume that you have that knowledge or at least a little bit of the knowledge that you need to have about the security topic from an admin perspective. And I'm going to focus today's talk in um, the different uh, means in which you have to enforce security in your Apex code and Lightning Web Components code, okay? So let's see if I can go to the next slide. So, well, obviously I work for Salesforce. So this is our favorite slide, you know, this is the forward looking statement slide which just means that as we are a publicly traded company, if you are going to purchase a stock in the stock market, make it uh, taking into account the functionality that is generally available. But almost everything that we are going to talk about today is GA. And if it's pilot, I'm going to explain that this is a pilot and it's a forward looking statement, okay? So, well, I already said this, I'm not going to cover how to configure security in your organization. I'm not going to cover how to uh, monitor security with event monitoring or transaction security, etc. Because if I spend some time doing that, the talk is going to be like three or four hours and we don't want to have that, right? And I'm not going to explain how to enforce security in Visual Force or Aura code, okay? Um, at the moment, we expect people uh, to be migrating to Lightning Web Components more and more. And I'm sure that there are many talks out there about how to enforce security in Visual Force and Aura. I'm going to focus in the modern framework that we use at the moment, which is Lightning Web Components and also Apex. So, well, I'm going to start with data security. Yes, as a quick reminder, sorry, I don't know why the um, arrow button doesn't work for me. As a quick reminder, data security um, are the different security layers that you can configure in your organi organization to uh, prevent access to data, right? To records in the organization. This security is configured in three different layers. First, we have CRUD security, which is basically the uh, ability to access a specific object in the organization, accounts, contacts, opportunities, etc. Then we have FLS, which is a field level security, which controls the ability to take a look at the different fields of a specific object in the organization, for instance, for an account, which is the name of the account, which is the contact that is related with the account, et cetera, et cetera. And we have sharing, which is the ability to see a specific records in the organization. 
As I mentioned, there are many ways in which you can configure three these three different layers in the or in your organ, organization. But what is important from a developer standpoint is to understand what do you have to do in code to enforce these three security layers. For that, we need to understand that in Salesforce we have two execution modes, right? First, we have user mode, which is a mode in which CRAT, FLS, and sharing. Sorry, I'm going to refer to object security as CRAT, which is create, create read, update, delete all the time because that's how it is in my mind. So if I say CRAT, you know, it's object level security and FLS is field level security. So I'm going to refer to object level security record level security and field level security in this way during the talk. And what happens in user mode is that those three layers of security are going to be enforced by default. What is user mode? Well, when you do an operation through the standard UI, you are using the Salesforce UI to create a record, to update a record, whatever, that security is going to be enforced. If you are using one of our APIs, that is true as well. If you are using execute anonymous on the developer console, um, the queries that you run, et cetera, are going to execute in user mode as well. And if you are using Visual for standard controllers, those are going to run in user mode. But I'm not going to talk much about Visual for today. So what happens with system mode? In system mode, CRUD, FLS, and sharing security is not going to be enforced by default. And that is the case for everything in regards to Apex. Apex classes execute in system mode, Apex triggers execute in system mode, Apex web services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we have the system mode? Well, because normally, uh, business processes, or not normally, but sometimes business processes need, needs to be able to process all the existing records in the organization independently of the user who is running uh, that business process or who started that business process, right? And that is why the security team in Salesforce decided to, okay, let's go and let's um, let's create our backend programming language in a way in which developers have the full control around um, the visibility of records, objects, and fields in the organization. So why are there certain cases in which you need to enforce security? Because there are certain uh, business processes for which it is required that user security is enforced, right? And that is going to happen also most of the times. If you are going to submit an application to a security review, it is completely fine if you have processes that run in system mode, but you have to explain why to the security team who is going to evaluate your code. You have to say, okay, here I, ha I have a process which is running in system mode because this process needs to have a specific access to all the accounts in the organization. And the security team is going to say, okay, it is justified, but you have to justify it. If your process uh, doesn't have a justification for running in system mode, then what you will have to do is to enforce CRUD, FLS, and sharing yourself, right? And well, there are several ways in which we can do that. First of all, let's start talking about how to enforce object and field level security, CRUD and FLS, okay? So, well, it's important to know that everything in regards to CRUD and FLS and also sharing is stored in the Salesforce data model, in the Salesforce database that it is under the scenes, right? There are a couple of tables that you can query to know which users have permission to access which records, for example, or which objects or which fields. But this is not normally the most convenient way to access uh, data security, right? But there are um, other ways 
that are much more convenient, simpler to use in your code and more performant that can help you and um, determine if a user has permissions to query a record or to update a record or to create a record and the same for, for fields, right? Today, we are going to take a look at four different ways of doing that. We are going to take a look at how to use a schema methods. This is the uh, most, uh, well, the, 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 is the oldest method of checking for CRUD and FLS, right? It's been there for a couple of years now. And there are two more uh, methods of checking object security and field level security that are pretty new. One is called with security enforced, and it's something that you use in your SQL queries. And there is another um, method that you can use in Apex, which is also pretty new, which is called security strip inaccessible. And we're going to take a look at some examples of how to use that. And finally, there is a pilot. This, this uh, feature is pilot that um, is trying to uh, give you some um, some APIs in Apex that will help you query the database, so, no, sorry, not query the database. Yeah, it's query as well. So it's querying and modifying data as well in your DML operations, specifying an access level, right? This is pilot. And I'm going to explain you a bit more of that later. So basically, schema methods are going to help me determine user permissions when I read data and also when I modify data. And it's the same for security stripping accessible and for the pilot that we are working on. But with security enforced is something that we are going to use in our SQL queries. It's a, a clause that we can include in our SQL queries. So to see all this is enough of slides because I don't like um, very much like explaining everything in the slides and I um, love to show like real examples. What I have done is to create an application, right? Well, uh, this application has uh, several examples that we are going to, to take a look at. And these examples, well, here in this, um, in this uh, desktop that I have opened, I have logged in with a user that has uh, low permissions. We are going to take a look at the permissions that we have for these users. Is this They are specified in this permission set. And we are going to play a bit with the permission set to understand how the four different methods, well, not the four, because the last one is a pilot that cannot use it uh, yet, but the three methods that we have seen for controlling uh, CRUD security and FLS security work. So first of all, let's take a look at how to uh, perform uh, SQL operations, right? Read operations for the database. So basically, if you just have a method like this one here, right? I'm just doing a SQL query and I'm returning those meth uh, sorry, those records without doing any specific checks in my query. Then what is going to happen is that despite my user doesn't have read permission on the account object, this is CRAT, right? Here, I'm able to see all the accounts that uh, this user has access to. This is, even though I am forcing sharing, we're going to talk a bit later about the confusion that there is out there about um, uh, enforcing sharing and enforcing object and field level security that some people believe this is the same, but it's not the same, it's completely different, right? So despite of that, I'm able to retrieve, uh, to read account records, I'm able to retrieve account records, why I, I, really, I really shouldn't, right? Because this user, the user that is logged in, doesn't have read access to the account record. Then, this um, this uh, recipe here, schema CRAT checks, corresponds to um, this 
apex method, right? In this case, what we are doing is that we are calling an apex method. I'm doing that from a lining web component, but just for convenience, because I wanted to show you the examples in an easy way. And this time I'm using the schema method to check if the account object CRAD is accessible. And I'm only returning the list of accounts if the account is accessible. Great. This time we are enforcing CRAD security. We are not getting ad read access to accounts and that's completely okay because we don't have read access to accounts, right? What if I want to enforce field level security? If I want to enforce field level security, here I have another Apex method in which I'm using also the schema class to check if the name of the account is accessible, if the annual revenue is accessible, and if the industry field is accessible. As you can imagine, this uh, method is stricter than this one here and is indeed uh, more correct, right? Because we are checking also for field level security. And um, as uh, some of these fields are not accessible. I'm going to show you that in the permission set. This probably I can make it bigger. Yeah. So here in the permission set, here is where you configure field level security, right? And annual revenue, for instance, is not accessible. You don't have uh, this user doesn't has doesn't have read access to the annual revenue field. So that's working as expected. We are doing an FLS check. And as my annual revenue field is not accessible, I'm not returning the account. There is a way in which you can uh, check for field level security. By the way, if you use this schema class to check for field level security, the object level security checking is going to be implicit, right? This um, kind of uh, method invocation is checking both for field level security and object level security. What else? Our second method with security enforced. What is with security enforced? Well, it's a clause that you can include in your SQL queries and that is going to return the records only if the user, the logged in user, has access to the object and to the fields that we are querying. This is, with security enforced, is equivalent to using the schema class and checking for every individual field, but as you can see here, is much less verbose and much easier to use, right? Um, if we take a look, at the with security enforced example, this is a lining web component in which I'm calling that Apex method that I just showed. I'm receiving an error saying, well, there are insufficient permissions, a secure query included in accessible field. So great, this is another way in which you can enforce CRAD and FLS and with which our security team is going to be happy. What else? There was a third method, I told you. This third method is called a strip inaccessible. And with this method, what we are going to, to do is to, we are not going to um, really check for the permissions, but we are going to gracefully degrade the uh, read check. Okay, so the read operation, sorry. We are going to gracefully degrade that. We are going to return only, only uh, the fields for which the user has access. And obviously that is going to happen only if we have read access for the entity that we are querying. What we do is that we instantiate this class, security strip inaccessible. We indicate the level of access that we want to check for, and we pass in a list of records. In this case, I'm doing the query here directly. So 
Uh, then this returns an um, um, object, which is an S object access decision. And from that object, if there are records returned, you can use a method get records to retrieve the returned records. So what's happening here? Well, basically what's happening is that as I don't have read access to account, that method is telling me that there is no access to entity. But what happens if I change this permission set and now I decide to give read access to account? I'm going to give read access to account records, but I still have annual revenue with no access and industry with no access, although I have access to the name, okay, to the account name. So if I do that and I refresh the page, the strip inaccessible method is going to detect that I have access to the account record, to the account object, sorry. I have access to the account name field, so I'm able to return a record showing the name, the account names to, to, to my user because that's uh, permitted, right? But I don't have access to annual revenue or industry. So those fields are not being returned. Very convenient, right? Great. So let me talk a bit about the pilot that I mentioned. So our security team realized that uh, using the schema classes sometimes is hard, right? It's very verbose and you have to check for, um, for instance, many fields if you are querying for many fields in your SOQL queries. And that's why they decided to release the with security enforced clause. So I think that the uh, user mode pilot um, the user mode that database operation checking pilot, um, it's being uh, created because kind of the same reasons. The security team wants to provide you an easier way to check for, sorry, to check for um, permissions, right? To um, for permissions in your Apex methods without having to use the schema class on and on. So what they are going to create in this pilot is a new parameter that you can use in your database.query methods, in your search.query methods, and in your DML methods, like when you are going to insert, update, absurd, merge, et cetera, et cetera, in the database. That way is going to be much easier to check for permissions when you are doing database operations than it is now. By the way, I forgot to show you the examples that show you how to enforce CRAT and FLS when creating, updating, or deleting records in the operations. So basically, the, um, the alternatives that we have are exactly the same as before, except the with security enforced one, because the with security enforced is only for SOQL queries, right? So what happens for this user that only has read access to accounts? I don't have create access, right? What is going to happen if I try to create an account uh, in an Apex method that, that it's not doing any CRUD or FLS checks? I'm going to show you the method. The method is this one, okay? There is a method in which I'm creating an, an account, okay? This is a popular BR brand in Spain that uh, <laughs> I wanted to use because a friend of mine have watched uh, many videos I've done and I sometimes use this uh, beer because I like it and most of the people in Spain hate it. So just <laughs> uh, for my friend, David. 
And so what I'm doing here is to create an account and inserting this account. And I'm not using the schema class to check for permissions. I'm not doing the stripping accessible methods. I'm not doing anything. So what happens? I don't have access to create the account, but if I try to create the account, the account is going to be created. It's letting me doing something for which my user is not supposed to have access, right? However, if I do a CRAD check before creating the account, this example here, right, in which I'm checking if the account is creatable before creating that, and I click on create account, then it's going to tell me you don't have object permissions to create that account. The same happens with FLS. Ideally, is uh, more correct to do FLS checks because that way you are going to ensure not only that your users has create access for the account, but create access or edit access for every individual field, right? So here I can check before creating an account in which I'm checking the name, the annual revenue and the industry, if those three fields are creatable. Again, if I try to create an account doing those checks, the security is going to be enforced correctly and it's telling me you don't have field permissions to create uh, or to specify these fields in the create operation for the account, right? The most modern way in which you can do this in a graceful way is using, again, a strip inaccessible. So with a strip inaccessible, is this example here, right? What we can do is to filter our account by permissions. So what we are going to do here, we are passing the account to the strip inaccessible method. And this method is going to remove every field from the operation for which we don't have edit access. If you remember, we don't have edit access for annual revenue and we don't have edit access for industry. So if I try to execute this operation, right, using the security decision uh, result, the annual revenue and industry are not going to be part of the operation that is transparent for me because the security strip inaccessible method is doing that filtering for me and the operation is going to succeed, but it's not going to store all the data, only the data for which I have edit access. So if I click on create account, oh, sorry. Uh, let me see. Okay, I need to um, add create permissions for the object. Obviously, if not, it's not going to work but I still don't have edit permission for the annual revenue or for the industry fields, okay? So let's try it out again. And now it should work. Exactly, it worked. If I go to my accounts tab, now here we are going to see, let me see if I can see all accounts. And there should be one account, probably the last one in which I have been able to uh, create or to specify the account name, but I haven't been able to specify the industry. Sorry, I cannot see here because obviously this user doesn't have permission, but here I have the same application with an admin um, logged in. So I'm going to open the view of the admin. This is the admin uh, with which I'm logged in. And we're going to take a look at the last Cruz Campo account that has been created. And we can see here that the industry and annual revenue fields have not been populated because the strip inaccessible method filtered out those fields for me because I didn't have permissions to edit them. Great, so I'm going to take a look at the chat window just in case there are 
some questions. Uh, uh, um, okay, so we have great Cruz Campo. Hi, Rogelio. <laughs> nice to see you there. <laughs> Off topic question. What extensions allows to see all commits in VS Code from Git? Ah, okay, so let me see. Uh, let's take a look at my extensions. Uh, 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 uh. Extensions, extensions. So this is probably e e e e Git history or Git lens. I think it's Git lens. Take a look at that one, okay? Um, okay, Git history, someone responded. Git lens to Git lens is the one that I'm using. Okay, no questions about crude or FLS. Amazing. So I hope it's please start clear that the three methods that we have asked of today to enforce crude and FLS are these three. This means that using with sharing doesn't have to do anything with crude and FLS. Okay, that's super important because people are really confused with this topic. So um, the examples that I showed to you, I'm going to share the repo later if you want to take a look, but those are like very simple examples for my presentation. There is something better that you can take a look at, which is Apex Recipes, okay? Apex Recipes is one of our sample apps uh, in the sample app gallery, and it contains lots of recipe to, recipes, not only to get started with Apex, but also it includes nice patterns and best practices in regards to Apex. In Apex recipes, if you go to classes, there you have all the uh, different Apex classes, examples, categorized in different folders. And there is a folder called security recipes. In security recipes, you are going to find uh, some recipes that explain how to use the stripping accessible methods, like with all the different combinations that we saw today and a couple more. And there is another interesting class, which is called can the user. This class is really cool because this class um, helps you uh, check for object and field level security in a um, uh, more uh, easy to read way. For instance, you can say, can the user read whatever record? And it's like the, uh, the names that have been used for the methods and the name of the class, et cetera, are like uh, more straightforward to use, okay? And also this class has an option to cache your uh, field level security checks. If you are using, or if you have uh, the platform cache available in your organization, this class is going to use that platform cache and to query, sorry, and to cache those queries or those checks for you. So it may be interesting to use at some point. I recommend you to take a look if you are interested in that. So now let's talk about record level security or uh, mostly known as record sharing. There are many different ways in which you can configure record sharing in the organization. Basically, behind the scenes, all the sharing configuration is going to be stored in this data model, in these tables. There is a table called user record access that you can query to check if a specific user has access has record access to a specific record. The uh, table has some restrictions. For instance, you have to specify a record ID and a user ID in every query, and you have to um, have access to the records returned by the query in order to query them. But I have seen some uh, use cases for using this table. This is not the most straightforward way to enforce record sharing, but for that, we have our sharing clause, the clauses that we use in the definition of Apex classes. So basically, when you use with sharing in an Apex class, that means that you want to enforce record level security. When you use without sharing, that means that you are creating a system process. You don't want to enforce 
record level security because you want specifically your um, code to have access to all the records in the organization. And again, if you are submitting your application to the security review for uh, listing it on the app exchange, the security team is going to ask you, do you have a, a business justification to have this without sharing here? And if you say yes, and you explain the justification, that's not a problem. But if you don't have a justification, then they are going to complain. So um, some years ago, we only had the option to set a glass with sharing without sharing or don't specify and no specifying anything, like not using a sharing clause at all, right? But a couple of years ago, I think three years ago, we released another clause that you can use as of today, which is inherited sharing. If you use inherited sharing, that means that uh, the uh, sharing configuration is going to be inherited from the parent class. And when I say the parent class, I say the caller class, the class that is calling or instantiating your inherited sharing class, right? This is kind of the same than not specifying a sharing clause, but is not exactly the same. It is the same if your class is being called by another class, which is with sharing or without sharing. In that case, we are going to inherit the permissions if you are using inherited sharing or if you are not using a sharing clause. But if your class is an entry point, in that case, the behavior is different. And that's why we do recommend to always use inherited sharing instead of not specifying a sharing clause at all. Also, the intention of the developer is going to be much more clear if you use inherited sharing. And we're going to know that you are using inherited for purpose and not because you forgot to use it, right? The difference is that when we use inherited sharing and your class is an entry point, right? And the class is going to behave as with sharing, so it's more secure. However, if you forget to include a sharing clause and your class is an entry point, then it's going to um, behave as without sharing. That is a security breach, and that's why we recommend against not specifying a sharing clause. Always specify with sharing, without sharing, or inherited sharing. So, well, I already said this, by specifying with sharing, you are not enforcing CRUD or FLS, just record sharing, so bear that in mind, super important. And um, I'm going to talk about the uh, Lightning Web Components use case uh, specifically, but let's take a look at the examples because it's going to be much easier. So here I have some uh, sharing uh, examples. Okay, uh, I have a class which is with sharing, is the class that we have been using uh, also for the SOCWELL and DML examples. And I have set up my account organization by defaults to private. That means, that means that the low permissions user is going to be able to see only the accounts that he has created by default, right? By default, if there are no more sharing rules implied. And the admin, for instance, is going to be able to see everything, but because the admin has a special permission to do that, right? So here in my with sharing class, the sharing permissions are being enforced and I'm able to see two accounts that this user created before, right? I just created uh, these accounts before starting the session today from this user and the two Cruz Campo accounts that we have created, okay? And you can see here the, the strip inaccessible uh, method worked correctly, right? In the previous, in the previous example. However, what happens if I have a without sharing class? If I have a without sharing class, all the records of the uh, organization are going to be returned 
I'm executing the code in system mode and all the records are being returned. So I'm not enforcing permissions at all. If I use um, a class that doesn't have any sharing clause specified, then, uh, sorry, this, this is the special case. Let's take a look at inherited sharing first. If I use a class that has inherited sharing specified, normally it's going to inherit the sharing configuration from the caller with or without sharing, right? But as here I'm using it as a kind of entry point, right? Is being, um, is, be, is behaving as with sharing. We go back to our table here. Uh, if we use inherited sharing and it's, um, and it's an entry point, is behaving with, uh, with, with us with sharing. Okay, it's enforcing the permission. So with inherited, uh, inherited sharing, we are not going to have a security flow. Uh, flow. So, however, with no sharing, if you have a class in which you don't specify the sharing clause, and you are calling that method from Visual Force, okay? I don't have here examples from uh, calling from Visual Force, but you have to believe me. Then the class is going to behave as without sharing. So if I was calling this method from, from a Visual Force page, the class would be returning all the accounts in the organization in contrast to the inherited sharing case. What's happening here? Why it's behaving this different? Indeed, when I saw this, I um, quickly uh, asked uh, Chris Peterson, who is the, the uh, product manager uh, for Apex about this, because it was super weird for me that in this specific example, uh, the no sharing case, the no sharing close case was uh, behaving as with sharing. And I expected it to work in the same way as it works in Visual Force, right? With, without sharing if it's an entry point. So he told me that uh, to prevent this security breach in Lightning, uh, we have uh, implemented uh, something in the Lightning Web component and Aura component call, when we call Apex, that is, it is forcing, uh, enforcing is forcing the enforcement of sharing permissions in case that you have a no sharing uh, class as an entry point. So this is a special case for lining, right? And this is why in this table, I have without sharing if entry point except for lining. So that you know, I'm going to show you the classes. The classes are uh, very simple. So this is the class uh, with sharing for the with sharing example. I have another class which is without sharing, the one in which we are not enforcing the permission. We have a class with no sharing, which is the one in which we are we forgot to include the sharing clause. And uh, we have the inherited sharing, which is the one that enforces the permissions correctly, right? Um, Chris also told me a forward looking statement that we plan to um, uh, require to have a sharing clause in your code uh, in some time. So in a couple of months, a year, I don't know the time frame, we are going to require that. So if you start using sharing clauses uh, as of today, better for you. You can use with sharing, without sharing, or inherited sharing, but we will not allow this use case in the future, according to Chris. Okay, so uh, there's something else that you can use in uh, regards to sharing, which is a system run as. The system run as method is a method that you can use in test mode to uh, create unit tests that run your user as if you were uh, the user, whatever, right? So for instance, here we are creating a user. This user uh, has uh, this profile ID, which is the standard user profile. And here we are running this code if we were a user with that standard profile. That way you can uh, test for the different use cases in regards to sharing. 
Also, very important, if you use system.run as, this method enforces record sharing, but is not going to enforce CRAD or FLS permissions, okay? Uh, this this, this uh, Apex code, as it is Apex, it runs in system mode, and CRAD and FLS are not going to enforce, to be enforced by default. Okay, I'm going to take a look again at the, at the uh, chat, just in case. Okay, uh, we have a question which says, is there any reason or use case where a schema objects or a strip inaccessible would be preferred over the elegant with security enforced? Yes, so um, generally speaking, I would say that with security enforced is preferred against the schema uh, methods for sure. But for a stripping accessible, you have a use case, which is gracefully degradate the operation that you are doing. As we saw in the examples, if you are querying an object for which the user doesn't have permissions, if you use with security and force, uh, sorry, for which the user doesn't have permissions for a specific fields, if you use with security and force, no, no records are going to be returned. However, if you use a strip inaccessible, the record is going to be returned, but with only the fields for which the user has access. So it's a really great use case for a strip inaccessible. Okay, uh, there is another question. Without any FLS or crude text in Apex, if we use lightning record edit form, will the object and field permissions still be taken into account and this question is a really great question and it's very <laughs> time convenient because i have this slide here in which i was just going to talk about that if you use lightning based components uh, lightning record form lightning record edit form and lightning record view form crad fls and sharing are going to be enforced for you and if you use the lining data service, wire adapters and functions, this is true as well, okay? You don't have to worry about crude FLS or sharing. Obviously, for an aligning web component, you can call Apex. And then if you call Apex, you are responsible for doing that enforcement of permissions. Okay, there is another uh, question here. I have in mind the use case of querying so well use case. Uh, I think, uh, Andrit, you were trying to respond, yeah, to, to the previous question, is what I said. The stripping accessible is going to, to let you um, implement a graceful degradation. And there is another question from Cecilia. Cecilia, hi, Alba. I have a question about lining out. What kind of consideration should I have whenever I need to develop using lining out and the lining record edit form component in lining web components? Um, okay, so basically lining record edit form is going to enforce that security for you. So if you, do, if you use lining out, I would expect that this is still the case and that you don't have to worry about those permissions in that context. Okay, Cecilia? Um, okay. Uh, 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 okay, 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 perfect. So no more questions in the chat window. Now I'm going into the second part of the talk. I'm sorry because it's taking too long. I'm going to try to uh, do it quickly. And the second part of the presentation, it's about application security. So application security are the kind of vulnerabilities that are going to affect uh, your web application, injecting a malicious script or uh, being able to gain access to your database and stealing some data, right, for instance. Uh, are able to uh, modify either what you have in your database or the code that you are uh, showing to the user in a browser to execute malicious code, right? So the first kind of vulnerability that we are going to see is SQL injection. Okay, SQL injection, right, for SQL is the number one vulnerability 
in the world. This is a list that um, organization called um, Open Worldwide Application Security Project, I believe, um, creates every year or every couple of years, I believe, right? And they evaluate which are the vulnerabilities uh, in the uh, web application works, the most common vulnerabilities that are happening as of today, right? And they create a list and they, obviously this is a very simple list, but they give you documentation about all these vulnerabilities. They tell you how to uh, prevent them and so on. And injection is the first one in the list. In Salesforce, we don't have SQL injection, but we can have SOQL injection. The good news is that this is not going to happen in most of the cases, because if you are using a static SOQL queries, uh, we, um, we um, sanitize the inputs for you, so you don't have to worry about that. But there are a couple cases in which you may be victim of a SOQL injection attack and that you as a developer must know, okay? So um, I'm going to better show you an example of this and we are going to just open our app with the admin user because I'm not going to talk about record data or data security anymore. So here I have another tab, which is a SOQL injection example. So basically, I have here a couple of examples. I'm going to close this. We are going to move this here. Okay. I have a couple of examples about SOQL injection. Those examples are here, I believe. Yeah. So here in, in these examples, what I'm doing is to execute a query in different ways. Okay. The most simple way would be this one, in which we say, okay, I want to uh, get accounts and I want to filter them by their name. I'm going to filter them uh, by a value that has been specified by the user. So it's the user who's entering that search value and we are uh, using that in our SQL query, right? So for instance, here, if I want to filter by Cruz Campo, this query is filtering correctly and I have that query implemented in different ways, okay? So the first case is the one in which we use a static SQL query. Here, I have some malicious code, okay? This malicious code is, um, so we'll injection. Okay, so is this one? Sorry, this malicious code. This malicious code is trying to modify the query that I'm doing. Look at the query. In the query, I'm just filtering by word name like whatever, right? And here, the attacker knows or is able to 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 know, right? Doing some test and having that intelligence that uh, attackers usually have, that there is a pattern that I can enter in that search field to modify the query a bit. And I'm going to modify the query and try to get the accounts for which the annual revenue is greater or equal than 2 million. That way I'm gaining access to sensitive data, probably because I'm able to um, modify that query to return whatever I want to, to see, right? Uh, or find out, for instance, which accounts have an annual revenue greater or equal than two uh, million. I, I've, just ha I've just realized that here I'm showing the annual revenue, so maybe it's not super meaningful, the example, but imagine that the annual revenue is not here, okay? Imagine that the annual revenue is not here and that I'm an attacker and I'm able to uh, guess which accounts have annual revenue bigger than 3 million or than 2 million, right? So if I'm trying to tweak the query, but I'm using a static query, we are going to sanitize the input. So that's not going to be a problem. Static queries 
I'm not vulnerable to so well injection. But what happens if I'm doing the same in a dynamic query? In a dynamic query like this one here. Uh, 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 uh. This one here, right? Uh, the dynamic query, what I'm doing is to specify the query and then concatenate it with the user supplied value and then order by name. So in that case, the attacker is going to be able to um, gain access to, to those uh, accounts and modify the logic that my SQL query is doing. So this is vulnerable. Dynamic queries are vulnerable to SQL injection. How can you prevent dynamic queries from being vulnerable? Well, first option, as I said, use a stat static queries. Second option is to use the bind parameter, the column parameter inside the dynamic query, because that way the uh, database querying engine is going to understand that it has to sanitize this value. Look at the difference. So before we were doing a concatenation and now we are doing, uh, we are specifying the value with a binding, right? We are, we are using the column symbol to bind it. And there is another way in which we can do that, which is more, uh, uh, more um, manual, right, really, which is, okay, I'm, I'm still concatenating the value, but as I know that the single quotes is the character that really uh, allows me to perform a SQL injection attack, what I'm going to do is to sanitize the input myself by escaping the single quotes. So this example here is uh, the one in which we are using the binding. And this example here is the one in which we are escaping manually the input. We are sanitizing the input manually. As you can see, the only one that is vulnerable to soak well injection is the one in which we are using the concatenation and a dynamic query. So not a big issue, but something to uh, remember and to understand. There's another option always, which is to whitelist inputs. So for instance, if you know that the possible values for um, a user supply values are uh, red, green, and blue, just specify a list with those three colors and don't allow anything that is different from that. And even sometimes what you can do is to cast to a specific type. If you are uh, expecting a number, cast to that number. That way you know that you are not going to receive unexpected uh, quotes in, in the user supply string. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So next vulnerability I want to talk about is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is um, the ability to inject a malicious script in our application, basically, right? Cross-site scripting is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the OWASP list is, is still a, a very important vulnerability, right? And there are three kinds of cross-site scripting. I'm going to skip that because um, I, uh, I, I know it's late. I've been an hour talking, so I'm going to skip this part. But if you want to know more about cross-site scripting, about the different types, take a look at them because it's, it's interesting to know that malicious script can be in your browser, but also in your database, right? And what uh, happens with cross-site scripting in Salesforce is that we have a fantastic tool to fight against cross-site scripting or that fights against cross-site scripting for you, which is Locker Service. Locker Service was created specifically for that purpose. In Locker Service, what we are going to do is to implement a um, group of security features, like for instance, uh, uh, enforce the uh, strict mode in JavaScript, don't allow that components that don't belong to your name space, access the internals of your components, use secure wrappers for global objects and enforce uh, the content security policy rules with unlearning web components. And all those uh, features are going to be a 
a great shield for your application are going to prevent that cross-site scripting happens in your uh, in your application in most of the cases and there are just a couple of things that you have to take into account as developers one thing i want to mention there is an api viewer for locker service so for instance, I said that we are not using the regular global objects. We are not using secure window. We are not using secure document or secure element. And we do that to avoid APIs that we consider that are vulnerable to cross-site scripting because security in Salesforce is our number one priority because we have customer data, right? Um, um, sorry, my cat is mewing <laughs> out there. Okay, so here, if you wanna know if a specific API is supported by our implementation of the global objects, you can take a look here and look for the APIs. And something that is interesting is if you have a specific code that you wanna test if it works with logger service enabled, you don't have to create a Lightning Web component for that. You can come here to the local console and execute your link here and evaluate, which is the result of the, which is the outcome of the script with logger off and logger on. That is something interesting to know. Um, in regards to CSP, CSP is, um, is a standard in which there are, uh, many uh, security uh, best practices specified and we enforce the security or most of the security practices enclosed in that standards. And that is the reason because of which, for instance, you are going to be able to load JavaScript libraries only from a static resource or from your Salesforce org right? You are not going to be able to download jQuery or whatever library you are using from um, URL. You are uh, not going to be able to use HTTP without the S because that's considered insecure for doing call out. You are not going to be able to execute inline JavaScript and much more. And that's all for your security, okay? So, um, what can I do apart from being super happy that Locker service is there, right? <laughs> so, well, first of all, if you are going to use a third-party library, we do what we can to ensure that that library doesn't uh, imply a vulnerability uh, for your application. But there are some tools that can help you evaluate that library before including that library in a static resource, for instance, and that are going to tell you if that library has some vulnerabilities. And we strongly, rec we strongly recommend to do this kind of checks. Also, um, there are some uh, cases in which you can um, make your components a bit more vulnerable to cross-site scripting. And that is the case, well, the first case is when you are using LWC DOM manual. So basically, LWC DOM manual in your components, it's going to um, let external libraries, a party library to manipulate the DOM. Normally, normally, if you manipulate the DOM using the Lightning Web Component Framework, we are going to take care of security for you. We are going to sanitize all the inputs for you. But if you are using LWC DOM manual, we are not doing that. We know that there are some cases in which you will need to use LWC DOM manual. What I want to say with this is that you should use it as few as fewer as possible, right? At least uh, as possible. Um, Okay, I'm going to show you an example, just the last example of what do I mean with uh, manually uh, manipulating the DOM and what do I mean with the framework manipulating the DOM because this was, um, I didn't understand this at first when, when I started taking a look at Lightning Web Components and I think it's interesting to know. So here I have uh, two examples. In one of the examples, I'm manipulating the DOM manually. And in the other example, I'm 
um, letting the Lightning Web Component Framework manipulate the DOM. I'm obtaining the same result in the two examples, but the, pro the difference is that if I let the Lightning Web Component Framework manipulate the DOM, this code is not going to be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. But because I'm doing, the framework is doing the san sanitization of the inputs for me. But if I'm uh, manually manipulating the DOM, the sanitization is not happening, right? And that's something that you have to take care of. I'm going to show you the code of these two examples. So basically, manipulating, uh, letting lining web the Lightning Web Component Framework manipulate the DOM means that you are using template for each and template if true or false, the template directives to create um, to manipulate the DOM to create like uh, conditional pieces of DOM or iterations. So here, for instance, we have a demographics variable. In this case, well, this is not uh, strictly uh, vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but imagine that this demographics variable is something that we are uh, creating, uh, manipulating, or getting some user input, or we are getting it from a third-party uh, resource, a third-party API, or whatever, right? In that case, if I let the framework create the iteration, this template for each is going to sanitize the input for me. But in this another case in which I'm using LWC DOM manual and I'm manipulating the DOM myself, right? Creating the iteration in my JavaScript code and uh, creating the elements and setting their inner HTML. If this demographics variable contains a malicious script on some, some malicious input, the sanitization is not happening for me. And it's something that I need to take care of. I hope that now you have a bit more clear um, what do I mean with manual DOM manipulation and uh, letting the framework uh, manipulate the DOM, right? Then there are uh, some APIs that, again, we allow because in some cases there are some libraries, third party libraries that people are using that um, need these uh, methods or these functions to work. And that's why we let them work in the Lightning Web Components context, but you should avoid to use these functions as much as possible because they are an entry point for cross-site scripting. Again, another uh, technique that you can use is to always filter your input, inputs. For instance, uh, we know that in cross-site scripting, the uh, super malicious character is the um, uh, greater than symbol and the less than symbol. So what you can do is to filter your inputs and just don't allow this character, right? Because this is what is going to modify your HTML and inject uh, unwanted scripts. And again, we can do it the other way around. What we can do is to encode um, when we output something, uh, and instead of using the great down character, we encode that uh, so that it's not uh, parsed by the HTML uh, by the browser as HTML. This is important because sometimes the malicious scripts may be stored in your database, right? It's not that always cross-site scripting happens from a third party site or uh, something that's injected in your DOM, but sometimes it comes from your database. So super important. Great. And there is something else that I'm going to tell really quickly, which is cross-site request forgery, right? And this is an attack in which imagine that you are logged in in your Salesforce or then you visit a malicious website, and in the malicious website, they know that there is an uh, endpoint that you can execute in your org to perform unwanted actions. In this case, the attacker knows that there is an Apex uh, method that you can call or Apex API to delete accounts. So the attacker returns a document, an HTML document, in which, for instance, there is an image with this source. 
what happens here that the browser, when it receives an image, is going to automatically try to download that image. And in this case, it's going to delete all the accounts that you have in your organization, basically summarizing it very quickly. This is what CSRF is. So what happens in Salesforce? In Salesforce, we have a standard protection. That protection consists of a token that we send in every a request to Salesforce. The Salesforce server um, checks that token in every request and the Salesforce server is not going to perform this action unless the, the CSRF protection token is correct, right? What happens that there is a small use case in which the token is not there yet, right? The token, let's say that it gets generated once you have loaded the page for the first time. But the first time that you load the page, the token is not going to be there. What is the way in which you can protect yourself against that specific use case in which your application may be vulnerable to CSRF? The way in which you can protect yourself is to never perform a DML operation in your component connected callback or in your component render callback. Basically, when uh, your page loads, your component load, loads, and it's the same for Visual Force Pages, okay? Why, why? Because imagine if this, um, if this uh, URL is not performing DML, that's completely fine. The user is going to navigate to, to this page in Salesforce, but it's not going to modify my database. The real problem comes when uh, you have a method uh, that is executing on page load, on lining web component load, that is changing your database. Great. Um, there is another topic I would like to talk about, but I don't have time for that, which is sensitive data exposure, okay? And you have to pay special attention to the different ways in which you store secrets in your organization, right? The best thing to do is to try to always use name credentials, protected custom settings, protected custom metadata types, and use Apex to encrypt secrets in your code. That's super important, but I'm not going to show you any examples of this because you have a whole trailhead module that explains this very well. And I knew that the talk was going to be super long. I'm going to take a look before uh, talking about the resources at the chat window, just in case there are any more questions. Uh, Blanca, love the session, thank you. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, yeah, uh, I will share the presentation. So uh, no problem with that. Um, here you have also some resources, uh, especially interesting, the trailhead module about security. There is a trailhead module, well, trail really, in which you have a couple of modules that talk about secure client side development, secure server side development. And this one about how to store secrets. Very useful. Apex recipes, remember you have a couple of recipes about security in Apex recipes. And this is also the, uh, the repo for the examples that I explained today. Okay, if you want to take a look at those examples more in depth, you can take a look at this repo, which is public. Also, I leave you a couple of links uh, from the Salesforce documentation, the security guide, the Apex security guide, and the section about local service in Lightning. And I leave you here also a video from, uh, I think it's Reinforce 2019, in which they uh, speak about how to create Lightning apps securely. I want to remind you that uh, Salesforce developers, we are in the Apex Hours, which is the channel in which I'm talking today. Um, if you have any more questions are here, I'm here, sorry. 